most effective uh, performance. Um, we're also going to look at the uh, the latest release of System Platform, which uh, dramatically increases the or reduces the redundancy fail over time. And then we're going to look at the uh, the leveraging .NET controls in an OMI client and and how that sort of best how that functions, how that works, and then sort of best practices around how to accomplish that. So we're going to uh, start off with the uh, with with redundancy and and before we get into the thing, just kind of go over a little bit of the core components of System Platform and what they do and how they contribute to the uh, to the redundancy uh, solution that that we typically want to engineer. So the first thing is is we have this object in the in our uh, galaxy uh, we call a platform, and unlike other SCADA systems where operating systems become redundant um, and everything, you know, the whole system fails over from one OS to another OS. Uh, in system platform, platform object represents the operating system and they are not redundant. Uh, <clears throat> and they're, they're by design, they're not redundant. So when you deploy a platform object, it is always running. It's always on, it's always, uh, uh, performing its its role and duties uh, that that it has. So platforms provide scalability, um, and they provide the ability for the application to span across multiple operating systems. But they do not provide by themselves a redundant capability because they're simply always running. So it's an they're active active in in, in that sense. The platform will host an engine, and the engine can exist in one of two flavors. Well, actually no, there's three flavors, uh, but the um, it can be a standard engine that is not redundant. It can be a redundant engine. And then when it's a redundant engine now, it can be a cold redundant engine or a warm redundant engine. And we'll take a look at that uh, later on in the, in the presentation. There's also a concept of something called a view engine. And a view engine is there to uh, deliver our view applications to a client to a, a to the platform the view engine actually does not run the view applications the view engine is there to provide a mechanism to deliver them uh, so and then platforms also configure something called a redundant message channel and the, we abbreviate this as the rmc the rmc is is actually a uh a, a separate network that uh, the platform is, is, is connected to. And multiple platforms, excuse me, can be on the same RMC channel. It's not a point-to-point -point connectivity. It doesn't have to be a, 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 you know, a, a simple crossover cable or anything like that. It can be fully network infrastructure uh, with routers and fiber optics and anything that you really want to put in play there. Um, and that it provides the mechanism for redundant engines to communicate to each other. So two NICs are preferred on the platform that is gonna be hosting a redundant engine. You have a process LAN NIC and you have the RMC NIC. Uh, if you do only have one NIC on the platform, the platform will issue a warning and it'll still allow you to deploy it but understand that, that, that once there's, without the two NIC cards, there is no way to determine a mechanism of failure and a platform uh, has, a, has difficulty in properly determining the failure mechanism that has happened between why we can't uh, speak to a, a particular uh, computer on the network. Given this simplified network diagram, right, this has obviously been reduced to just show this concept of redundant message channel. Um, we have four platforms here. Each one is connected to a process LAN. That process LAN is typically assigning uh, IP addresses by some DHCP server. The uh, redundant message channel is a separate set of NICs that I manually configure the IP addresses on, and that IP address is the 
that I assign to the platform is the NIC. It tells the platform which NIC card in its computer should it find the redundant message channel network. <clears throat> so this is a typical setup. You have DHCP up here, and then you know using a 10.10.0 protocol or IP address naming scheme down, down on the redundant message channel. So then we have application engines, and, and typically we like to have an, app, an, an application engine which is responsible for hosting the I.O. objects. And these are what we refer to as the dedicated device integration objects. These are the DD Sweet Link client object and the OPC client object. Um, typically, only one of these engines is, is needed per platform. <clears throat> and the point is, is that these objects should not uh, be on a redundant engine because the redundant engine isn't going to take any corrective action if they can't communicate. So we have other mechanisms for handling that in, a, in application server. But there's a common misconception of application server that the redundant engine will fail over if the IO doesn't work on that particular node. And that's simply not the case. Uh, the redundant engine is responsible for keeping track of the engines operating as a service frankly, really doesn't care if you're getting data from the device. And then the process engine is a redundant engine, right? So that's the one where we assign our areas, our redundant device integration objects, which do care about whether we're getting data into the device, into the, from the device, and our application objects, right? Obviously, application objects are assigned to areas. Um, when I put the area on the engine, all the assign all the application objects that are assigned to that area are assigned to that engine. Uh, we can have multiple of these can be assigned uh, per the OS per, per, to, to the platform, and having multiple engines will allow that platform to leverage uh, multi-processor operating systems, which is almost always the case these days. And then uh, when we configure these guys, there's a primary and a backup, which we assign in the IDE, and they become active and standby during runtime. Primary and uh, is the one that we do all the configuration on. The backup is slaved to the primary from a configuration perspective. But it doesn't matter. Either one can become active and either one can become standby. So app engines have behavior, obviously, that they, they're going to exhibit as they uh, as they execute. And so one of the engines will typically be active. And it's that it's that that means that it's uh, RMC com is good. This it could have uh, the standby not ready, meaning the standby isn't ready to take over. It could have standby is syncing with active, and it could have standby ready, which means that. The system is up and running, and everybody's ready to fail over to the uh, other engine. And the active can also have a state of standby not available, which means it can't find it via that RMC channel. And the comm is bad, or there's some networking problem, or something like that. Uh, it could be in a state of determining failover status, which is the initial state when it is first started. And it could be in a state of missed heartbeats. And this means that we're missing. We're getting comm losses uh, between uh, pings that are sent through the RMC and pings that have been sent through the process land. So it pings the other engine via both networks to make sure it's, it's healthy. Standby not ready is simply a case when the uh, active engine has lost communication to its partner. And uh, or if new objects are deployed and the necessary files are not installed yet on the standby application engine or if the standby engine has lost communication with the RMC uh, before it completed uh, synchronizing its data. Standby ready is the state when everything's great, the standby is ready to take over, everything is happening, all the code modules have been synchronized, checkpoint data with the active engine, it has all been uh, completed. And then the, the engines can go through various other characteristics. Uh, syncing with active means that the, the engine is, is in this state of, of, of synchronizing itself with the standby. It can go into a mode of syncing code. Uh, so engine, the, 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 the primary engine 
through the active engine will actually install missing software on the uh, the standby engine. It will also remove software that's no longer necessary on the standby engine, if that's the case. Syncing the data is when we're trying to, the objects are trying to keep track of their states and getting ready to uh, transition to the uh, standby ready state. It can be a switching to active, which means this engine is, is transitioning to the uh, active role. It was the standby, it's now becoming the active. It could be switching to standby, which means the, action, the active engine is switching to it, the role of standby. Uh, failed. When the redundant partner is uh, crashes, could be terminated. Um, state of unknown oops, is when uh, the redundant partner, uh, we can't find it communication. Typically, this is the case when the engine is undeployed. When the partner engine is undeployed. All right. So when we talk about IO failover, we typically have a process object, something that is uh, gathering, uh, responsible for, for running a, an asset or a device or some, some function, some process uh, component in our, in, our, in, our, in our galaxy. That object will speak to a redundant device integration object. And then that redundant device integration object will choose between which which IO server to get the data from. So the concept here is that the client objects, and these, these DDIO represents the sweet link client or the OPC client object, is gonna speak to a specific IO server. And this client object on this AOS node is gonna speak to its specific IO server. And the redundant device integration object is going to then pick between the two as to which is best able to service its needs. So it's important to configure these redundant device integration objects correctly, right? So one of the things is that redundant device integration objects need to be responsible for something that it can manage. And that is, it should only be really responsible for one device uh, to be managed by the, the RDIO, right? So, you can, you can create these things. There's a button on the thing that says copy common scan groups. But if, if, the, if the device integration objects that we're connected to service multiple um, multiple devices, then the RDIO can have problems determining which uh, path to use. So, uh, it's best if you configure these with just one device. It's okay to have multiple scan groups to that one device, but just have them only use one device. Um, when the RDI will switch, uh, you will get no gap in history. It maintains the quality uh, of the uh, connection throughout the switching. Um, the switch can be commanded or it can be automatic based on failure. Um, failover time we'll say is typically less than, is le should be absolutely less than 10 seconds. Uh, it's typically in the, one to two second range at most. Uh, failover is very, very quick. And the RDIO connects to what we call dedicated device integration objects. And so these are the OPC client or the sweet link client, and, and they should be connected to a specific IO server. Uh, you can have multiple devices connected to these guys. They can have multiple scan groups and they should be really dedicated to a specific OI server instance. And because we don't want these guys switching because when they switch, they have to disconnect and reconnect and, and, and that all takes time. And, and while the time is very short, it still is time. And it's also introduces a, uh, uh, a gap in uh, data quality when that happens. So they, they are typically deployed on the same OS as the OI server is executing on. Um, and the, the recommendation is, is don't use the server node care attribute of these objects as a switching mechanism. Create multiple DDIOs to handle multiple IO server instances and so that the RDIO can choose 
between which of those to use. And a single DDIO can service multiple RDIOs without any, tr any, any tr trouble, whereas OI servers don't want to have thousands of clients uh, connect to them, right? You want to have a small number of uh, clients, and then that client will service out to all the thousands of objects when we have in a galaxy. <clears throat> Historians are part of this redundancy scenario as well, and they must be uh, active active. Uh, you can't have a historian in a passive state. Uh, they need all the relevant data. Um, it's re really in our historians are partnered. Um, in this case, we're, we're going to demonstrate a main site historian and a DR site historian, and they'll be uh, synchronized. The app engines uh, do all that synchronization. They, can, they synchronize the configuration and they synchronize the uh, store forwarding uh, to each historian independently. So this is a typical example of, of, of the historian redundancy configuration. Again, the network has been greatly simplified to just show the relevant components. We have two object servers connected with their RMC. They're connected to a series of devices. And then the, uh, the object server will write the data to one of the historians. The historian A, for instance, is told that his partner is historian B, and historian B is told that his partner is historian A. So when the object writes to historian A, it also then says, gets the identification of its partner and will start to stream the same data into story B. <clears throat> the partner will uh, engine will do the same thing. It will store, they both will store forward the data if that's the case, whichever active engine is running on whichever AOS at the time the historians come back up will be the one to forward the data into the historian. So uh, the configuration is very simple and uh, the execution is, is actually very robust. A client making connection to one historian will then switch that client connection in, in the version of it to the other historian if historian A in this case uh, is shut down. Switching will occur automatically, and that's the partnered historian uh, concept. All right, so before we get into DR sites, we're going to I have a system running up here in our uh, integration studio environment. It has it has a galaxy repository, it has two object servers, it has two historians, and it has two in-touch workstations. Uh, the uh, Historian A and Historian B are also doubling up as the DR site object servers, just in case anybody was curious. So in this case, we have our platforms defined here, we have our Galaxy repository platform. We have a, a object servers, two object servers at the main uh, control room site. And then we have uh, our DR site object servers as well. We have two workstations to present our, our client information. The, the DR object uh, platforms are also our historians. If the 
illustrate the concepts. So here our system is running. We have our two object servers here, AOS1 and AOS2. And they are then uh, hosting four engines that are active and uh, standby. Currently, all the engines are running on AOS1 and their partners are running on AOS2. There is also a IO engine, which is hosting the uh, device integration objects. If we look at that here. This IO engine is a non-redundant engine and it's hosting our uh, device integration objects that's connecting to our simulator. There's another one on this one and it's also hosting a device integration object that's connected to its simulator. The redundant device integration objects that are located here on the redundant engine, these guys, are connected to this one as, as primary and this one as secondary. The app objects will use so the uh, redundant device integration objects to communicate and choose between which of these. Uh, client objects to gather their data from. So here we have our redundant device integration objects and their uh, connectivity. Um, we are, we'll illustrate this failover by looking at our uh, historian historical data. That's the, the most accurate way I can demonstrate uh, redundancy. So here we have a series of tags um, that are coming from our simulator, just a simple uh, triangle wave, uh, just to illustrate um, the redundancy functionality. We put this trend in live mode and see it function. If we do a, a failover, so we can, this is simply a, a button that's gonna force all the uh, RDIOs, there's 12 of them, to uh, fail over from primary uh, to backup. If I click this button, we'll see that the IO will switch. And there it, it switched. So now all the data is coming from the IO server on the other computer. We come back into our historian. Um, we're seeing a, a, a change here because these two simulators are not synchronized. But there is no gap in data. The data is still contiguous. If this had been a real device, it would just show uh, the, the actual device data being very accurately represented. Uh, we may have lost one or two VTQ transmissions from that device, but we didn't lose, we didn't get a gap in our data. And, and I, that's probably the, the important thing there. Uh, the switching is very, very fast. Uh, and um, the IO server, uh, the RDI is responsible for picking between one of those IO servers. Okay. 
again, we could flip it back. Um, we can also then uh, do a failover of the engine. So in our current configuration, if we look at our engine, In service pack one of 2020 R2, a warm redundancy functionality has been added. So this, this now, in prior to this version, the uh, standby engine was in what was called a cold state. It was not executing or running and uh, it had not gone through its startup sequence. And it was, and when it failed over, it would go through that startup sequence and begin running. In service pack one of 2020 R2, this warm redundancy capability was added. And it's an option. You do have to enable it um, on your existing engines. And, and you must do that on an engine by engine basis. It's not something I can lock. As you can see, it's not something I can uh, fix at a template level. And that's the same with the redundancy thing. So it would be the same behavior as, as redundancy. If I had built a template and made this a warm, redundant template, then subsequent instances would have this enabled. But uh, I do must uh, check that checkbox on each engine that I want this functionality to be on if the engine was created prior to uh, putting that on a template. So when we do the failover here, we can tell our uh, system to fail over and we can fail over a single engine if we wish just by commanding that engine. And it, it fails over. Um, it's now executing on the AOS2 computer um, and then it's synchronizing itself back with AOS1. So if, you, if there's a difference that you'll notice here is that the failover is actually very fast and the synchronization takes a little longer because it, it doesn't worry about syncing so much as it does getting the new engine up and running and then it worries about fixing and making the data so now the engine is standby ready. But that gives us a, uh, uh, so the, a much faster response time in failover so that the active engine, the standby engine becomes active very, very quickly. And we can see that in our historian. So currently the engine has failed over and what you're gonna see here is that the engine failed over and, it, and the new engine didn't quite make connection to the historian immediately and it had to store forward some of its data. And so in a, in a few seconds, this engine will, forward that data back in, up to the historian and we'll see the true gap in history um, that exists. So this is currently showing about, a, uh, we can stop it and take a look. So you can just see the fill-in just occurred and now the gap in history. If we look at this, very precisely is right around two seconds. So we now have gone from a, approximately a 30 to what, 60 second failover mechanism in the previous releases to about a, a one to two second failure mechanism. And this is equivalent to the IO server failover um, per, per performance. And so this is really a dramatic increase in the performance of uh, redundancy failover that, that occurs with this. Uh, so now we have this, this warm uh, redundant uh, capability. And again, you could balance your computers if you wish. You could, uh, you know, tell them up, 
tell the odd ones to run on a different. So we have the odd ones running on platform two and the even ones running on platform one. Uh, you're able to, to, to control that and allocate that any way you wish um, for a normal operation. But in the case of failure, one of those things, they'll all run on the other uh, computer. So as we move into disaster recovery, <clears throat> we can have, uh, yeah, let me just get this out of the way. Various reasons for wanting to do this. Um, you know, you can have safety of personnel as the primary reason. You could have some natural threat that's occurring and uh, you could have some civil unrest that you may need to be protecting against. But usually in this case, there's some advance warning, minutes at a minimum, right? And, and you have some kind of uh, uh, warning where you can make preparations for evacuation and, and choose to leave. And then you can also make system preparations as well. Then you have the case of destruction of the main uh, control room site, right? Which you have could be natural disaster, could be civil unrest, could be, uh, but it, this could be sudden, no warning. You could have earthquake, explosion, bombing, plane crash. I mean, all the types of scenarios that you could dream up here, right? And so when you have a few minutes of warning, we can do a stateful transfer of operations to a DRC, right? So we can have all the engines, uh, we can transfer all the engines over to the DR site. They can checkpoint themselves with the active engine uh, on the main site. All the alarm states will be preserved. All the set points will be preserved. Uh, event logs are preserved. Um, store forwarding for the main site when it comes back online. So the engines will automatically go into store forward to that main site to, to get the data back into that uh, other historian. Um, you want your GR to be a virtual machine so that it can transfer to a uh, virtual machine host at the DR site and still function and run there. And you could have no prior warning as well, right? So you could have electrical failure, but typically if, you, know, you would have a UPS to back up long enough to complete the transfer to the DR site. Um, you could have main site destruction, right? Well, we now have to restart operations at the DR site, uh, which means, you know, we have much more work to do. Um, but the biggest problem we have is if you lose, you, you probably have to get, you have a personnel problem as well, right? You have other things to, to, to get involved with. But once all those things are resolved, we can have our GR uh, reestablish itself on a virtual machine host at the DR site, and the app engines will start from a deployment state. If we had critical data, we could script initialization of that critical data uh, from the DR historian uh, for critical settings. Um, alarm states will be based on current data if we redeploy, but we could also reestablish those alarm states if we needed to um, with uh, the historian. Um, the set points will revert to uh, deployed settings because we can redeploy uh, with, with the, the initial value. So that concept of preserve changes won't exist on, on this particular case. Um, and uh, event logs uh, are preserved in the historian because the, uh, the two historians are active active all the time. Uh, and everything will feed back to the main site when the main site comes back online. And this is a typical network scenario. Again, it's been simplified to only show the relevant components, but typically what we have is we have a, a, a main operation center. It has a virtual machine host, which is running on all the virtual machines. Our Galaxy repository is there as a, 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 as a virtual machine. Um, our main historian could be a virtual machine or could be uh, a, a dedicated OS. Um, we have object servers. They could actually be running in our virtual machines or they could be dedicated uh, independently. Our, our typical case is that we have a single interconnect between those two sites. In other words, 
the RMC needs to map through that same fiber connection or Ethernet radio or whatever it is that we have going between these two sites. Uh, and so we don't want that happening all the time. We only want that to use that interconnect or transfer. We don't want the redundancy mechanism to always be going from site to site. So we really don't want to have in normal operation an engine here at the main site and its partner engine here at the disaster recovery site. We want the two engines to be partnered here at the main site and, and handle normal operation because the greatest source of downtime that we typically are dealing with is administration. And so when we want to do patches or system maintenance or supply security patches from Microsoft or anything that happens to happen, um, we, we, we want the system to be operating uh, using this redundant message channel locally uh, between the two uh, partnered engines running at the main site. But in the case of loss, we want to be able to transfer this in a stateful manner to the uh, to the other site. And then, Mike, it looks like we have a few questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, so the first one is from a few minutes ago, so I'm not quite sure what it's referencing to now, um, but it says, is there an instance where you wouldn't want that enabled? Oh, the warm redundancy, I assume, is that that's the question was about? Haven't come up with one, but as a software vendor, we like to do no harm, so it's disabled by default. Okay, in other words, it will, it will run the way it was before. Wonderful. And then is there any document available to calculate the time required for redundancy based on I.O. or something? You know, I've been trying to generate that, and it doesn't seem to be I.O. based. The failover I've done from a few process values to over 19,000 on a single engine, and the failover takes the same amount of time. Okay, and then is redundancy really fast as demonstrated in case IO count is more than 100,000? Well, in that case, we wanna have multiple engines. And so, as I said, I've tested up to 19,000 IO points on a single engine. But, uh, I mean, recommended guidelines is no more than 25,000 IO points on a single engine. Thank you. And that looks like all of our questions for now. Okay, great. And I'm just getting ready to do, do this demo here. Hang on. Challenge of live demonstrations is what we can. must be <clears throat> So the concept that we're going to demonstrate here is you have basically a physical virtual host at the main site and the DR site. Uh, the GR, and this is the case any, every, all the time, right? You must virtualize your repository. And, and the reason for that is that the repository is kind of like a domain controller for the galaxy in that it owns the galaxy. And if you create it on another computer, that's not the computer that owned the galaxy. It's like if I had two different, uh, if I had a domain in my, in, my, in my company and someone came in and unplugged my domain controller and plugged in a new domain controller and, and, and called it the same name as the one that I had before, the computers would not recognize themselves as a member of that domain because they're not the one, that's not the guy. That's not the one that created the, the, the domain in the first place. And they joined up to and all these other things, right? So there's all kinds of internal identifiers and things that happen to make sure that this is the one that, that created us. And the repository is the same way. Yeah. 
So <clears throat> you, your AOSs, your historians and things may be virtualized, but it's not required. I mean, they can still run on bare iron if you want. Um, you have a main site historian partnered to a DR site historian. So historians are partnered to each other. Uh, we have communication drivers are duplicated at the main and DR site. So obviously if we switch over to the DR site, we wanna be able to get to all our device communication uh, that we have uh, available to us at the main site, right? So in this case, we have dedicated client objects to the same node as our com drivers. That's typically the case, but again, they can be on different computers if we wish, but I see no purpose in, in, in doing that. I think it's best if the uh, client objects are on the same node as the com driver, therefore you're not dealing with any networking between the client object and the com driver. And then the uh, two AOSs at the main site and two AOSs at the DR site. Uh, that's the, you want to have a minimum of those at the main site. The DR site you could have one object server if if you wish. And that means you won't have redundancy when you go over to the DR site. But it's up to you. That's a that's an optional thing. Um, but the important thing is that all in touches, OMI workstations, in touch access anywhere, and remote desktop servers, historian clients are duplicated at both sites as necessary. You know, we, we don't want to be deploying these guys because they don't have their redundancy is based on duplication. You don't want to have them uh, having to be restarted and rerun at the other site. You want them already there functioning and working, right? Uh, and if you have remote sites, uh, those are left alone, right? Typically, I mean, unless you can't communicate them from the DR site, but that's really a, a design problem. So, and again, if it's a critical site, you should have two AOS platforms at the remote site to handle its localized redundancy. And so when you have a, failover sequence with warning, you simply will undeploy your, sta your standby application engines on your uh, on your main site. And then you will uh, then deploy your uh, and then you'll place those engines on the DR site AOS. That process of undeploying the standby only will not affect the active engine. So the active engine will still be run. You'll then deploy the active engine, the, that those standby engines to the DR AOS. And when they achieve a standby ready state, that means they've already synced and you can force the failover from the active engine to the main site, at, at the main site. And that's why you'll get that approximately one to two seconds of downtime. And now the DR site has the active engines and you can then go back to the, uh, uh, they'll transition from standby ready to active. The DR site is now the active site. A stateful transition has all been accomplished. I now have everything running at the DR site all my set points have been preserved. All my alarms are preserved. Everything is, is historian is all store forwarding and doing whatever it needs to do. Um, all the client UIs are getting the data from the DR site now, whether those client UIs are at the main site or they're at the DR site. <clears throat> and then um, I can go and then undeploy the engines on the main site 
But again, that undeployment is not downtime because the active engine is running on the other site. And then I can place those undeployed uh, active engines to the other DR site AOS, just drag and drop them, place them over there and deploy those engines to the DR site. And then when standby ready status is back, I now have a fully redundant application at the DR site. And here I'm saying less than one to two minutes of downtime. That was uh, prior to service pack one. Uh, easily this is gonna be within less than 30 seconds of downtime. And then I can shut down the GR on the main site VM host and start up that GR on the DR site VM host because I've used the virtual machine technology to transfer those operating systems. So it's very important to leverage the redundancy and the capability of the, of the component that is providing your functionality. An AO, a GR is an operating system level redundancy and a virtual machine is very well, very capable of handling that high availability environment of preserving that operating system between two hosts. Device connectivity is a very, uh, is a network based uh, device connection redundancy. And, Virtual machines could care less if our network is, if our devices are communicating. Um, same with the engine redundancy. The engine redundancy is a service level redundancy. Again, it is not going to be responsible for virtual machines. For um, it, it's it's not going to be responsible for device connectivity. And so, by properly using the right component to handle the right mechanism of failure, we can greatly increase our, our uptime and, and responsive time to disasters and, and, and simply administrative recovery if necessary, right? So if we don't have any warning, right? And we the main site has been destroyed, right? Or rendered inoperable without any warning whatsoever, um, then we have the case we have to do a cold start. Simple as that, right? You just, no, there's no, I mean, we lost it, it's gone. Right? We can simply start up our GR on the DR site VM host. Um, and in that case, we'll have an out of sync condition. The GR will think that everybody's deployed. And so we want to undeploy um, the redundant application engines uh, on failure, uh, mark them as undeployed, um, include their redundant partner, take them all out, and now place the primary and backup AEs. on the uh, uh, <clears throat> on the DRAOS platform, and then we'll cascade deploy those redundant layers. The system's now restored, um, but it restored from uh, initial value. Uh, so if we do have to have more advanced things, we can we have that historian there that we could leverage reestablishing some uh, IO points or alarm states or everything that, that, that could be involved. All right. So there is some consideration if you use flex, flex licensing, um, there is multi-engine platforms, uh, then you're fully compliant with this architecture. The single engine platform, uh, will allow uh, only one primary engine. The intent there is that primary engine is uh, the one doing the uh, process work, not the IO connectivity work. Um, so we can use a, uh, a backup engine uh, to host our device integration objects. Uh, we're not gonna go over the details of that in this presentation, but uh, we're sure that this is so. When you deploy a, a partner of an engine, you don't have to deploy the primary. You can just deploy the backup. Um, and then view engines, and no, there's three types of platforms in flexing. You have multi-engine platforms, single engine platforms, and no engine platforms. And the no engine platforms allow view engines and backup engines. So I simply take my, uh, the, the, the backup engine and I can sign it to a single engine platform and it's not gonna be counted. All right, so let's get back here into our uh, redundancy scenario. We have a problem here. Why this is a problem with my virtual machines. Yeah. And any questions? 
Yeah. Looks like there's a few questions in the chat. Okay. Do you want to go ahead and take them, Tom? Sure. Um, licensing is not uber expensive. It's really no more than what you did before because you're one galaxy. You're not buying a second galaxy. Um, uh, there is no such thing as an active passive GR. Uh, you have to do a virtual machine transfer. Uh, it, it's not, um, not available for the GR. The GR is, is, a, is a single operating system and that same operating system is the one that owns the galaxy. So we must move the operating system for it to, to, for it to move. Uh, why not? So the question is why not just use the VMware fault tolerance or high availability between the two sites? Um, simply because it won't make corrective action. VMware technology or even Microsoft Hyper-V or even uh, other things won't make corrective action for all the failure mechanisms that we're trying to account for here. Uh, it only, they only make a corrective action when the, uh, the virtual machine fails. Now you can manually transfer that, I'm, I'll fully admit, when that virtual machine, when, that, when the device connectivity doesn't work or something like that, but you know, restarting an operating system on a uh, virtual machine framework is not going to be as fast as what we've demonstrated here. And uh, connection speed um, varies, is gonna vary, but the, uh, the response is typically it's a, it's a one meg connection is what we're looking for. Uh, yeah, we, there is a spreadsheet for, um, there is a spreadsheet uh, to estimate your storage data rate for uh, per IO, um, your account manager can get that to you. Yes, you do need a license for each historian. Uh, and the second historian is at half cost, I believe. Yes, we have seen people stretch the RMC across two different locations, and that's what this is demonstrating. The point being is that we only want to use that stretched RMC in, the, in, in a, a very specific isolated case. We don't want to use it all the time. <clears throat> and then I did have one come through as a direct message to me. Um, is there historian store? Historian storage spacing guidelines, is there a data rate per IO? I cannot seem to find information stating these requirements. There's a, as I said, there's a spreadsheet that we can provide you that will calculate your uh, IO network loading for uh, historian data transfer. Um, an estimate, uh, uh, approximate, value you can use is 100 analogs changing once a second, we'll use 8K of network bandwidth if you use compression. Perfect, thanks Mike. And it looks like that's all the questions for now. <clears throat> well, in the interest of, uh, <clears throat> yeah, so the, the, in response to the fault tolerance in HA is very quick. Absolutely, fault tolerance in HA is very quick. Uh, but what triggers it? That's really the, 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 the situation here. Um, a, a virtual machine will not fix itself if I can't talk to a device. It will only fix itself if the OS doesn't work. All right, I'm gonna uh, move on to the, I've got to do some corrective action on my inter integration studio environment. So I'm gonna move on to the next topic while that's being fixed and we'll come back to this DR demonstration.
that's okay. All right, so <clears throat> when I look at uh, so the, the, the use of OMI controls into uh, uh, .NET controls into OMI was, was re recently introduced. And they do behave differently from, uh, They do behave differently from when they behaved in InTouch. So in InTouch, you took an OMI control, a .NET control, for instance, and you placed it inside of an orchestral graphic, and then you put that orchestral graphic or industrial graphic, we now call them, on a uh, on a window. In in the OMI framework, <clears throat> the uh, con .NET controls lives in live in the panes of the layout, and this is going to assume that you kind of know what these terms are. Uh, we'll, we'll briefly cover what these concepts are, but a, a layout in in the in the framework of of system platform, I have a an environment that we call a uh, a screen profile. And a screen profile is simply telling the system what type of monitor we have connected or what type of screen we have connected to the computer and what its functionality is. Is this a touch screen? Is, it, is, is there a taskbar that's supposed to be on this? If so, where is it supposed to be? Uh, <clears throat> and is, if it's touch screen, do you want a touch level lock with uh, two-handed operations or a command lock button? Um, if you do have a command lock button, where do you want to put it? And you just define to the system how this monitor is supposed to work. And, and if you wanted multiple monitors, you simply add them in, right? You can move them around and, and change their orientation. And make, say, a four monitor uh, workstation, right? You can even add different monitors. You could make those like a big TV. And, and you can expand your screen profile to include up to 50 screens on a workstation. <clears throat> now, these screens then get carved up into uh, what's called a layout. And the layout is broken up into panes. So when you, when you make a layout, it defaults to the full size of the screen. And then you can carve up that layout into multiple panes. This is like creating windows in the old in, in, in touch or other HMI type windowed environments, right? So here we have a, a layout and we can break that up into different, different panes. And each pane is equivalent now of what we used to call windows. And there's all kinds of things you can do with panes. But the point being is that a, uh, a .NET control lives in a paint, right? So, so as we look at, a, at an application here, so this is an application where everything you're seeing on the screen for the most part are individual .NET controls. And this is our batch product. And I'm using this as an example because this takes this .NET control usage to an extreme so, so in, in some cases. And uh, it, <clears throat> requires me to understand some best practice around creating uh, .NET controls. So 
if I was to build this as one layout, it would be very, very difficult um, if we start to uh, build each of these things. Because every, like this button here, this start button is a .NET, .NET control. This hold button is a .NET control. If I have to create panes to place all these guys in. And organizing this whole thing with all these different panes would be very difficult. And also trying to rearrange it or anything else would, would, would become, uh, I'll just say problematic, right? And so if you look on this, this window here, I, I can pick a batch and I can see it's SFC and I can interact with the SFC. I can zoom it in and zoom it out. And I can do the commanding of, of, of these controls, uh, make things behave, I can hide them, I can show them, I can, you know, all kinds of capability that I've built into here. Um, I can acknowledge this action and, and every one of these things is an independent little .NET control. So the way you do this is you want to break these up into uh, more functional layouts and each layout contains the controls that we want. And so if we look at this screen, this is that layout. And we have this section up here, which is this, the list of our batches. We have our, uh, those, those batch command buttons. If we look back here, these buttons here, this little thing here is its own little layout. And so when we, when we look at that, And we could edit that, that layout. This is that layout with those buttons. And each one has its own individual little pane. So, you know, just come with best practices is you can rename uh, layouts. I like to name them as uh, panes, I'm sorry, within a layout to what they are. Um, this is the start pane. This is the hold pane. This is the restart pane. This is the abort pane. This is the cleanup pane. When you click off the layout, you get, so when you're on the layout and you look at something, by default, it shows you the properties of the content that's, that, that you're focused on. This is that batch button and all its properties. <clears throat> if I click off this and just click on the white space around it, I see layout properties. So one of the things that's, you know, is, is that I can tell a layout what its target is. Is the target going to be a screen? Or is the target going to be a pain? Or I can just leave it on the side. But if the target's going to be a pain, as in this case, in other words, I want this layout not to go by, by on a whole screen all by itself. I want it to go inside of another layout. And I want it to be a specific pain in the layout. So I said, I, I picked that batch execute display, which is this one that we were looking at, right? I, I picked this layout. And now I can target which pane in that layout I want to place this particular layout in. And by picking this one, the layout editor will now size itself to show me how everything would appear in that, in that small section of this other layout. So this layout is gonna target this guy. So important for that, just for visual design, to know what, what spacing and real estate you're gonna have and have this size itself appropriately. But also what's important is that anytime you use .NET controls or, or something, there's probably some scripted behavior or something you wanna put in here to, to deal with this. When you put the raw control onto a pane, none of that scripting comes with it. And so by placing a layout, I have scripted behavior that I can have on here that will show me how I wanna do things when, when certain stuff happens. And so I basically added um, some on show scripting and some event scripting off these controls. Every time their state changes, I want them to change their color to highlight the state that, 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 that they're in. And all this script behavior is attached to the layout. So by putting these controls in the layout and this layout, making this layout reusable, 
I now, all this scripting is modular and it comes with it and I don't have to reduplicate the scripting every time I drop a control on it. So if we look back here into our thing, as we look at our batch and like the, the things we can do on that highlight when we pick the batch that we want. So this one we could start, this one we could place, we could hold. So if we hold it, it then restarts and we could restart it and abort it, right? If we restart it, it goes back to hold option again. And as we look at its execution, all this behavior that we wanted the control to behave is contained in the layout that we that hosts that that control. So important concept to understand is that if you just take a raw control and drop it into a, a pane of a new layout, it doesn't bring any scripting with it. But if you take a layout that contains that control, then all the scripting can come with it. And again, we acknowledge it and you can see how other things are behaving. So <clears throat> the second thing that we have is you let us up here, we have this .NET control, which shows the list of our batches, but we also want a title on that control. So if we would come back here into our layout and look at this one, right? <clears throat> so this is our control here. Notice the control does not have any sort of title, right? So uh, in this case, we chose to put the title as a separate pane uh, in the parent layout. And the title is actually up here. In this one, if we look at, at the uh, SFC, Our title is, is, is a separate pane, and inside that pane is an industrial graphic, and inside that industrial graphic is simply just text to say, well, this is our title, right? That's all that is. And then the other thing we have here is we have this other industrial graphic that we want to command the, uh, the SFC.NET control. So in this case, this industrial graphic has got buttons, like for instance, we have the zoom in animation. And what it's doing is it's writing a, setting a bit on a namespace object so that the, the layout can, monitor this bit and then execute appropriate scripting when we turn it on. So when we look at our layout scripting here in the SFC, go to our scripting, you'll see that we have, a, again, a bunch of scripts that we've created to define the behavior and interaction between that button bar and our .NET control. And so <clears throat> by putting all this into a layout, we don't have to reduplicate this every time. We can now can just drop this combined collection of, of, of the title, the button bar, and the .NET control into one uh, layout. And that layout now becomes content for other uh, layouts. And, and this is what lives as I said, back here in this section of our main layout screen. And other ones are done for different, different things. Down here, down below, we actually have a series of buttons that, that, that select the content to place in this pane, and this is what we call the batch details pane. So if we look in here, we can see if we have questions, we click the questions button, it puts content into here. If we want to select equipment, we have equipment selection. We want to look at our active transitions. We want an interactive phase editor, right? And you can even nest these beyond. So in this case, we have this thing and this more detailed thing is a separate little layout that we did and place that inside this layout, which is inside this other layout, which is effectively uh, just reusing all this stuff. But <clears throat> the point being here is that when you 
you know, divide and conquer this set of real estate, if we you know, look at this, it's much easier to manage than it is. So, you know, if we come down here, And we go to our uh, inactive uh, phase editor. is a is a layout. It contains another layout here, and that is a separate layout that we've placed inside there, and that's the one below it. The phase error prop. You see, this is a much more detailed uh, set of panes and things to put all this in a larger pane. You know, you end up with the, I like to say the little tile puzzle, right? Because you can, it's, you can, you have to kind of slide these around by extending other ones. And it becomes very, very difficult to do if it gets too complex. So by breaking this up into smaller pieces, I can manage it. I can build the uh, appropriate behavior. And uh, if I have scripting that I need to have in here, I can do that. This one obviously doesn't have any. The, um, <clears throat> so in re the result is, is that I get the UI that I, that I want and uh, things are behaving as, as they should and the scripted behavior is, is all there and it's reusable and I can, I can reuse it and make it easy for me to uh, more modularly construct this application. When I first attempted to do this .NET control thing in OMI, I was just in, you know new to this like everybody else, and you know I first started building this pane, this layout, and it's wanted it to look like this, and I ended up with like I don't know 160 panes, and it quickly became completely unmanageable. So a different strategy was required, and I'm giving you that strategy now so that you don't make the same mistake I made when I first attempted to do this. <clears throat> but again. This is just our batch product, but it's not demonstrating the batch product. It's really demonstrating how something that has a lot of .NET controls can be organized inside of all my. So the other thing that uh, you need to be aware of is when you import .NET controls into system platform, and you go to import, uh, when you did it before, you imported what was called a client control, and you did this and the control became available to, uh, to the orchestra graphic or the industrial graphic when it was used in InTouch. That's not how it works with OMI. OMI, you, you bring in the controls via this mechanism called an orchestra app. And so to bring in controls via an orchestra app, I need to take all the controls, like in this case, I have my historian client controls. I need to take all the controls and place them in a specific directory that I want to bring in. If we look at that directory, it contains all the .NET controls that we want to import. And I basically just copied them here from wherever they were uh, set up. These were all in program files, x86, you know, blah, 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 blah. But <clears throat> I took them out of there, put them in this special directory. And then in an app server, when we uh, look at our that directory comes in as a single entity. And so if we open up a, uh, if we create a layout, and we want to put something in here, like let's say we want to go grab our, uh,
our client controls. Clicking on that object exposes then all the controls that were brought in from that directory. And now I can take those controls, like the, uh, where's the trend? Like the trend control and put it in here. And yeah, I've got some problem here, but I hate it when stuff doesn't work. So the, uh, the, the, the controls will allow me to here and go into batch management and grab the batch controls. So we can grab our batch list control, for instance, and drop it in place. And in this case, first thing we have to do is tell our batch control what it's going to be. And that's by going in here and calling up this little dialog box and saying, I want to show you batches, right? And then when you do that, the control now is told what it's Kind of be so one of these controls can morph into many different flavors but at the end of the day is that that control must live in, in a pane so the the concept we're trying to demonstrate here is how to properly apply uh, .NET controls into an, your OMI application and then some best practices around how to reuse those controls and make the content more reusable by not treating the controls as individual content, but placing the controls inside of a layout, scripting their behavior to an industrial graphic that might be inside that layout as well, and then put you treating that entire layout as the content you wish to place inside of a pane of another layout. You can even take those, those layout contents and make them associated to an application object, and then that application object will dynamically populate your layout panes with content that matches the uh, content type. So when you look in here and you look at a layout, you can give it a, uh, a content type to decide where this content is gonna fit in the uh, auto population mechanisms that exist in, in, in OMI. Do we have any questions on .NET controls? Yeah, so a quick question here. Um, the .NET control would be sort of like a parameterized, uh, that, that would be like the parameterized way in system platform. Uh, so for example, in other applications where you create faceplates and reusable objects, um, the, the proper the process procedure here would be going through this .NET control over a parameterized way where there's like a unique value um, so that I don't have to like, you know, use the same object and just do like, you know, like you said, the copy paste modular method, but only change one number in a parameter somewhere. This is the way to do it would be through .NET. No, no, no. It, it, the, the, the point of .NET controls is they're external things, something that another application provider is giving me. And I want to utilize those inside my OMI display. So in this case, the batch product that we have has a series of .NET controls. OMI is not natively aware of those .NET controls. Understood. The historian has a series of .NET controls. Uh, the trend control, for instance, or the tag picker control. Um, if you look at the OMI app here, and I switch to, so each of these controls came from something, you know, this. It could have been from a maintenance system or from other things, right? That, that I have, and I want to be able to leverage them. Prior to OMI being able to uh, you have this feature of accepting a .NET control, um, you couldn't bring .NET controls into an OMI application. 
So .NET controls are typically things provided by another uh, product or another vendor. And I want to leverage them inside this. This is not to replace the things that you can do natively inside of System 5. Yeah, I had a question I put in the chat. Um, we have the, uh, the more advanced historical client and uh, also the alarm uh, client in an orchestra graphic. Right. Um, and is that now able to be embedded or no, it needs to be broken? No, so, so you can't embed the orchestra graphic that contains a control. The, but you can put the control into a pane and then have that enough. So like, that's what this recipe uh, sequential function chart procedure was showing. This is the is control, there, this SFC, and the graphic that commands it is above it. Is there documentation on how to get like a, a drop down menu to interact with that .NET control on a different pane? Depends on uh, what the mechanisms are that you wish to use to, to, to leverage that. I mean, what that interface is going to look like. If the interface is simply a, a series of commands and things, yeah, you can put that, that drop down, just like any orchestra graphic can, or industrial graphic can have a, a drop down choice box or something like that. Um, yeah, previously we, we built out a file structure on the, uh, the trend screen to manage uh, trend files that operators could pull up uh, throughout the plant, you know, on whatever workstation. Yeah, 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 I understand. So the, the, the properties of that trend control, if I were to place that trend inside of a pane, are now fully exposed to uh, the OMI framework. Uh, if I, I forgot, good point, I forgot this one little thing. So when I look at my scripting environment here, I reference my, con my controls by using the keyword, my content. So when I come here and I type my content and I hit the dot, it'll show me the controls and the orchestra graphics that I have inside the layout. Okay, thank you. You have to excuse me. I, up until knowing that this was possible, I think we've kind of deemed this as not ready, but now it seems like something we could uh, move to, but it would take some time to convert things. It's not an it's not a one for it's not an automatic conversion. Absolutely, um, you do have to because the the concept is of a .dot net control living inside of the orchestra graph. It currently doesn't exist. There's plans for that, but it doesn't exist. Before. So the two live separately in a layout. And they're related to each other with this my content right so this is the orchestra graphic the ffc i'm sorry the toolbar and the sfc is the dotnet control so if i want to do something from the toolbar right i could uh adjust whatever i wanted to do right In the um, buttons pane, uh, where you had the five vertical buttons, I noticed you had each button in its own pane. Is there a particular reason for that, uh, rather than putting the five buttons in a single pane? And the reason for it is that they're all separate .NET controls. And, and, and the purpose for, that, for doing this was to demonstrate that complexity, right? So when I come in here and I go back to that, uh, that button pane here, right? Just the way these controls are built, each of these buttons is an individual .NET control. There's not one control that contains all five buttons. Oh, gotcha. So each .NET control has to be inside its own pane. Correct. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, so it, unlike say, an industrial graphic, I could have put all five of these controls independently on the same graph. They think of the layout as the graphic, right? I can place all buttons inside of a layout, but in order to do that, I must have a pane 
there to receive the control. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a different concept, and it's what I want to highlight some of the details. Um, Any more questions on, on the .NET controls? Um, it looks like we have a few more in the chat. I mean, I have like a, I guess like a very basic question. It's all right, I joined a little late here, so I probably missed it at the beginning, but um, the, you, so going back to so the .NET control, um, is to communicate with within and without and like in and out with other um the base parts of the system platform right i just want to understand the dot net control i didn't quite yeah so so dot net controls are typically things that other vendors will give me or either products even from aviva right to consider another product to be like another vendor right so <clears throat> the historian for instance has a series of dot net controls the um the batch product that I'm demonstrating here comes with a series of .NET controls. I can use these controls in anybody's client that can accept a .NET control. And OMI previously had no mechanism to accept these. So now it does. And I'm just trying to demonstrate how you could take these externally provided pieces of content and properly integrate them into an OMI application. And you mean control like a PLC, or you mean literally like another platform, like a factory talk SE, bring it in here and be able to communicate within those two platforms? Yeah, it's more like a, typically a, uh, sometimes, you know, a product such as like an MES product or another historian or an alarm or provider product or or yeah, I got uh, you. Like uh, Win nine one Win Win nine one one or top yeah, three. yeah. Okay, I got you. Yeah, so a third party, uh, like it, okay, I understand now. Okay, so right. you don't. Yeah, all right. Sorry about that. Got it. Yeah. So so so, it's not for internally communicated things. It's for you know, hey, this other product gave me this widget control thing, and I want to use it in my OMI app. How do I do that? That's really mm -hmm. how this. What this. Means. So you pull that script, and ah, I got it. Okay, I understood. I understand yeah. what we're doing here now. Okay. Yeah. Sir, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Are there any limitations as to what .NET controls OMI could use? Uh, possibly. I'm not sure of, of, what, of them at the moment, but... Uh, Oh, let's see, I'm sorry, I should probably, it started here with Chad. Uh, is there any app node or recommended architecture document about how to set up VM and storage space needed for historians? Uh, yeah, in the, uh, you know, readme files and install guides, there's all kinds of suggestions about sizes of, of, of operating systems. Right, if we have a .NET control embedded in a Kestrel graphic, can that be embedded in a, in a pane? No, it cannot. And, and that's the purpose of this, this demonstration is to show you how to do it correctly. Um, we use a trend and alarm net controls in a way that holds a lot of value to us, a lot of time spent making it work to provide us to our customers. That's why we're, we're clinging to them. Of course, I understand. Um, and, and the point is, is that if you do that conversion, you wanna do it once and then we, we use it so you can deliver that value to lots of other customers as well. So <clears throat> um, I, I'm not the... Uh, the direct conversion of an industrial graphic to drop into a pane holding .NET controls does not exist. Oh, why did you put, I think we answered that one. Why did you put buttons inside their own pane rather than multiple buttons on the same pane? Because each pane can hold one and only one control. And, uh, right, sorry, you answered mine already. Can OMI use ActiveX controls? No, it cannot. Uh, OMI cannot use an ActiveX. <clears throat> After the ActiveX has really been deprecated, um, but OMI. 
what OMI does, just so you know, right, and we're not, uh, is it takes the .NET control and it wraps it up as a WPF, a Windows Presentation Foundation control, and it converts it. So when you do that import, it actually rebuilds the control as a WPF. <clears throat> All right, so here's our system again, uh, running in visual in, uh, we'll and switch back to our DR topic. So if you look at this scenario here, I've got my active engines running on AOS 1 and AOS 2 has got my uh, backup engines. And if I look in runtime, I'll notice that, oh, indeed that the primary engines are the active ones. There's a role the engine has as primary and there's a role the engine has as backup and they, the primaries are all active. They're all running on AOS 01 and the backups are running on AOS 02. So, you know, there's many ways of architecting these types of solutions. And various ways will give you different types of results. And, and this is merely just one way of addressing it, right? So I can come in here to my primary, my, my backup engines, right? So I don't want to actually undeploy the uh, IO engine because it's running, right? And there's actually an IO engine running at each site. It's connected to, in this case, it's a simulator, but it would be connected to an OI server or that would be communicating to your devices. And there could be multiple clients communicating to multiple devices. I mean, this is designed as a demonstration, not as a full end all system. But I can come in here to my uh, backup engines and I can undeploy them. And when I do so, I'm not selecting cascade undeploy and I'm not selecting include redundant partner. I'm just taking these engines offline. And if I look at that here, you'll see that my standbys are all, all going to a state of unknown, meaning I've removed them, right? And But the active is still running. The active part of this scenario is still working and functioning and, and doing everything it's supposed to do. Um, it's preserving all its states. It's make sure you know, the alarms are all done correctly, right? And that state preservation is also something that, uh, that, that doesn't happen when you restart an operating system. So now they're all undeployed. And I could take those, see these are on AOS 02, and I could say, let's put those on AOS 02 DR at the DR site. I drag them over and place them there. Now I could script this whole behavior with a product we call GR Access, which basically makes the GR, all this functionality programmable. But I'm, if I did that, you wouldn't see what's happening, right? So I'm, I'm actually showing all the manual steps involved, but this could be all automated to be a button, right? You know, hit this button and transfer over. And now I've moved those over and then I can deploy them, right? But when I'm deploying them here, I'm deploying them to the other platform that's located at the DR site. And I don't wanna do a cascade deploy. I don't wanna do any of these other things because I just want the engines to go out there. Remember, as a standby engine, the active will ensure that it's configured correctly. Now, the deployments can take time. And, but this time that the deployment is taking is not downtime. Because the active is still the active. In this case, our standby has become ready. And now our standby is ready over here. And these systems are, are basically synchronizing themselves to come back up 
to be uh, standby ready. Have a, this, the integration studio does not allow me to nick cards, and so the lack of two nick cards causes me some reliability problems. So the little icon that's shown here on our engine, in this case, it's green and yellow. And then in this case, it's yellow and green, meaning this one here is the one that's not active. This one here is the one that's active. So I've just basically moved everybody over to the DR site. And when it syncs all up, like it did now, everybody's, so the standby engine is no longer running on AOS 2, it's running on AOS 2 DR. And this one here is the AOS 2 DR, they're all AOS 2 DR. Now, when I execute the failover, the active is going to go from AOS01 to AOS02DR, and that failover happened very quickly because we have warm redundancy now, and our standbys will will sync back up. There, now the standbys are all synced back up. And, and now the system is running at the DR site. All the functionality that we have is running at the DR site with the active engine there. The standby is still back at the main site. And at this point, we've gone across that, that network bridge. But then we, do, we don't wanna be operating that way all the time. So you know, we, we're gonna, if this was a long-term transfer and, and we expect to operate here for, for a while, we'll come up here into the main site and we'll undeploy these engines. And again, we're not including a cascade and we're not including the redundant partner. And it doesn't matter that these are the ones configured as the primary. It's what's the role they currently have in, in runtime. So we undeploy them. We can see that happen here. The, 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 primary, the, the ones that, that were designated as primary are now going into an unknown state. But the, 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 the backup engines are the active ones and they're still running. They're not affected by this undeployment. And now we can then take and assign those to our AOS 1DR. And then deploy them. And again, this whole process, I could, I could script and, and but again, I don't want to do a cascade deploy. I don't want to include the redundant partner. I'm just sending these engines out. Because I don't want to affect the running objects that are running on the active engine. I just want the standby to come out and the standby is going to, going to be deployed. And then the active engine is going to recognize its standby is up and available. And then it's going to configure that standby to be its partner. So you can see the icon changing here. 
this icon means both engines are deployed, the active and the, and the standby are, are available for use. But that whole time of deployment was not actually downtime. The redundancy functioned and ran on the active engine during all the time that it took for us to transfer the location from one place to another. And they're syncing up and getting ready to, to, to be. But now the entire system is now running over at the DRC. And it's running there in a completely stateful fashion. All the set points have been preserved, all the alarm times have been preserved, all the alarm states have been preserved, all the historical data is still happening, all the event logging is occurring, everything is uh, functioning as we intend. Looks like three needs now. We go back to our historian and you'll see that we had this small gap in data that occurred when we did the transfer to the DR site. And that will actually be filled in when the store forwarding finishes. So when the engine restarts, its primary mission is not to, it's to get running and functioning and collecting all the data. And uh, it, has, it does take a few seconds for it to reestablish that connection to the historian. And the data that's collected in that meantime is store forwarded. There, the system's up and running. Everybody's at the DR site, and I can do whatever repairs are necessary at the main site or wait for whatever caused me to want to leave to abate, and then I could transfer it back. Uh, GR Access is a uh, scriptable interface or a .NET programmable interface. It's not GR Active, it's called GR Access. It's a, it's a library that, that exists to uh, one of our toolkit libraries to uh, programmatically command a Galaxy repository. Any more questions? That's the content I have for today. Can, can I deviate from uh, the .NET control in the OMI um, or sure. was this strict on this? No. Okay. Um, yeah. So. I was having some challenges. So I asked you a question earlier about the parameterization, right? Um, and if that was the dot, the, the way to do it in system platform was a .NET. So we got past the .NET control is to bring in third-party application um, buttons and interface and control like this one, uh, you know, platform that you're showing here. Um, is there, can you happen to create an object uh, that is like a parameterized object where it 
um, you know, does what I was uh, sort of describing or would I have to like schedule something else for that? I would say it would be best to take that offline and arrange another meeting uh, just so we understand exactly what you're talking about. But a industrial graphic, I think is what you're referring to. And an industrial graphic is or maybe let me put it in the uh, sorry in the citizen platform terminology. So what I'm cha I'm challenged with right now, and it's a very basic thing I'm guessing, is creating a template object that um, you know has uh, that. So for example, um, going back to the modular programming and you so creating a UDT with a template object. Um, um that's just very that has a pop-up that simply grabs all of the data or from that tag the udt tag that i've created and i can just like copy paste it and change you know a parameter or a value um within its properties uh that automatically is you know sort of like copy pasted tags based on the udts So, <clears throat> yeah, that's probably the answer to that is going to be more detailed. Uh, but we create a, um, an application object mm -hmm. to link to your UDT. So, in this case, uh, you can create a, um, an application okay. object, for instance, uh, okay. mm -hmm. that is. call it my UDT, right? Sure. And then in that object, we would define as its attributes, the elements of the UDT. So your UDT will have a series of elements, right? Yes. Yeah. On, off. Right. Static. So, you know, yeah. right. And, you know, we could call it on. And sure. Create another one and call it off. off. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Right. right. <clears throat> And so those elements, we would add as many elements, attributes in here to uh, replicate the design of the UDT. And in fact, there's even, depending on where that UDT lives, we have software which will read the UDT and automatically build this object to represent its element. Um, in the case of uh, Alan Bradley and Siemens, that's a function called auto build. In, in the case of uh, Schneider Electric controllers, that's a capability that is called asset link mm -hmm. and those things basically will read the udts read the structure of the plc and build objects to represent the udt uh, complexity and when you have udts inside of udts they'll make objects to represent the contained udt and then contain that object in another object type of thing right? so yes right. like yeah and an and bit like a parameterized object correct yeah it's very right. embedded yes yes and then I can simply, you know, add a, a graphic to mm -hmm. this temp Remember, I'm still working on a template now, right? Yes, yes, yeah, the template. Mm -hmm. Right, and so I can add a graphic to this. I can go edit this graphic. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, could you just throw a valve on there? <laughs> or it, sure. it, I, I think that's like a basic object, right? Right, so I could, let's grab a valve. Right, so here's my valve, mm -hmm. and then I can say, I can say, so I reference the template with the keyword me. Okay. So I say me on, I want the valve to show it's on, right? Yes. In this particular case, I have one bit that I, you know, I could have two bits if I wanted to, but this one's just one, okay? Sure. So in other words, the valve's gonna change its color when the bit goes on or off. Yes. 
And now I save this. And now this template has a valve display, which will show its status mm -hmm. of that UDT that we linked up to. And then every time I create an instance of this, I'll get a unique copy of that graphic, the link to that instance for every UDT that I have. For every, so I take my UDTs and they instantiate themselves as symbols, right? Okay. And so I may have a hundred symbols based on the same UDT. Yes. So I would instantiate this object a hundred times and say link to all my hundred symbols. And there you have it. What about the tag? So it's, let's just say I have valve V1, V2, V3, right? So I have to do I every time right now what I'm doing is every time I create the I you know use that my UDT valve, for example, I have to go in and I have to tag to put the tag at the uh, the IO assignment. I think it's what it's called, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way so where I that can like I don't have to go and reference that tag every single time and I can just like change one value? Sure, you, there's all kinds of ways of handling IO assignments and things. Um, and making it as elegant as you'd like. Uh, <clears throat> there's some built-in functionality and that may work for you, it may not. Uh, you can always put that IO assignment scripting on the UDT itself, and on this object itself, and then deal with it however you want to deal with it, uh, format it in any special way. But uh, that, that's that, there, there's, there's a lot of options there that we, we can leverage. Well, um, so if you go to the UDT, for me, please, sorry. And I, I, I don't know if I'm still on the board here. And if anybody has questions, please stop me. <laughs> um, it, so the available feature would be the IO, right? Um, right. And then that's- Yeah, you, you, you basically make these guys IO. Yep. Yeah, so then you put your tag there. But how do I make that a sort of like a, like I said, uh, do, would I pull in a tag, tag from the PLC and then put like a script, like some- you know, maybe, I don't know, let's just say brackets or something. And then that's where I would put that valve number so that I can just copy paste it and change that one value. That's, I guess that's where I'm stuck is, is, is arrange is putting, arranging this, the format of the IO assignment so that I don't have to do so much work and it can be more, uh, you know, redundant and modular. So every time I create a UDT in my uh, PLC, I create a new tag. So I have a UDT. Whose PLCs are you using? I'm using an Allen Bradley PLC. Control logics? Control logics, yes. Yeah. So what I would do is I would use auto build. Okay. Auto build will redo control logic PLC and create all these templates and instances based on that and map them all back and do that. But let's just say I already created all the screens and I just want to edit this UDT. So, okay. I mean, you know, kind of like it, like if I had to manually do this, like I, if you can just do it for me real quick. Like I said, I, did, uh, I was struggling on creating that mapping format for this tag structure. So I have my tag structure and my PLC all straight and squared away, right? So every time I create a valve, I use that. I, my. All right. So go ahead. So if you're gonna come in here and, and then uh, create an instance of this. Oops, forgot that the coming keyboard strokes don't work in the browser. <laughs> I create a new instance of this guy, right? There he is. Yep. And I assign it to, uh, here, let me just give it assign to an area. There you go. I put it on an area. So I 
could assign them to, to this scan groups of, of one of the device integration objects. And now he's going to get his data from, from this guy. All right, so he's basically said, formatted his request and said, I'm going to go ask for, I could change the name. He's going to ask for my UDT 001 dot on and dot off. And there you go, the reference works. Solution is to create an array tag and assign that array indices to the individual instances. So you can, I mean, the end of the day is that this format structure here is what's going to be what's called the input source and output destination of this attribute. You can write a script to do it, to build the string if necessary, if you had all kinds of other special things like elements of arrays, for instance, that you want to be able to put in here into the item name uh, and just tell the object your array element 10. So put a 10 in this part of the string. You can know all kinds of things like that. Yeah, I, I have a question. Are, are you able to hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Oh, um, so just on the auto build, so I tried the auto build, and one of the things I found out is it wasn't picking up tags. I guess, you know, I, I want to say there were like global tags. So is there a way to pick those up, or do you, you have to manually pull those? Because it seemed like it built all the objects for me for, you know, a lot for like the um discrete inputs and such but the, i noticed that i was missing some tags and when i looked you know at the actual io list it, it and i also loaded them in top server it was able to pull up the global parameters of that application but for some reason on auto build i couldn't find them so they were tags that are just loose tags not created as part of a udt i believe so i like i said they look they look kind of like they were like uh, global variables in within the PS. <clears throat> right, but they're simply basic data types. They're not. Um, yeah, they're not structures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest, I, it's been a, I haven't used, it's been a while since I used that auto build feature. So I, I, I don't know where it's at right now, but um, I don't know if it actually picks up discrete individual tags. Okay. That aren't part of a UDT. And then one other one was kind of from a design perspective. Um, is it recommended, you know, I, I started trying to figure out, you know, I'm, I'm building these templates, you know, up here for these pieces of equipment. And I basically started building templates, say, for like a generator. Because, you know, generators, we're, we're only wanting the same data points for each one. And within that generator, right, there'll be various meters, you know, meter yeah. equal, things right. like that. And there'll be multiple layers within my template. And my thought was, you know, fill out that template as best as I can. And then when it comes to deploying it, then I can just plug in the IO. So that way I just, you know, deploy a template and plug in the IO versus, you know, having to create the layers of the object. Is that, is that recommended or, you know? Yeah. I mean, without looking explicitly at your case and looking at the, the, the application, I mean, uh, what you're really talking about is, do I put multiple things inside of a single object or do I create multiple objects? And either technique uh, work, it depends on what the, you feel more comfortable with or what suits your needs better. Okay, there, there will be no impact to performance because like- No, no, none whatsoever. I, my template right here, you know, like you have sequencer and all this, I have a template that's basically like a generator and it yeah. has about four layers, you know, sub layers underneath it with, you know, various objects that are just like meters and things. So Correct. Was... It's not going to matter if they're all in one object or in separate objects. Okay, cool. That, that, that was it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mike, we also had a couple more questions in the chat. There was one about uh, rule of thumb for max objects on an app engine. So that's always a, you know, it, I get that question all the time and I don't blame you for asking it. Um, it's a very hard question to answer. And I try to look at it more on a 
I'm not, the engine doesn't care how many objects are on it. Really, it doesn't. It's a number of objects, right? Um, what it cares about is what is the workload that the engine has to execute? And the workload is more one of what is the aggregate throughput that I'm expecting that engine to do? And, and the reason why we will come up with parameters such as you know, the engine can support 25,000 IO is because we're expecting that IO to change about once a second. And that's really the throughput that the engine is expecting, 25,000 changes per second. And then the follow-up to that question was whether there was a rule of thumb for max app engines on a platform and whether that was dependent on their machine's RAM, which so do you think? <clears throat> it that, that's gonna the platform is gonna say how much memory and CPU do you have and what is the workload of that, right? So you know if I have one CPU and two, two gigabytes of memory, my space on that platform is much less than if I have, you know, 32 cores and, and 180 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes of memory. So totally dependent on resources. The platforms are not, so engines in App Server are what communicate with each other. Platforms are just another engine to serve the purpose of hosting the other engines. But technically, if you could do it, but you can't, or you could turn the platform off, right? Or you could set your platform scan rate to be, I don't know, 30 minutes, and it would scan once every 30 minutes. It's not going to impact the engine performance at all. The engines run could run at, you know, 500 milliseconds on a platform that's running at 30 second scan rate. So the platform has no dictation of the the performance of the engine. It's simply a vehicle for getting the engines assigned to an operating system. The, the resources are really, how much is the engine gonna be utilizing? And, and the two things I look at on an engine is what is its uh, idle time and how much memory is it using? What's its working set? And, and the engine has all those parameters on it that you can look at. But uh, you know, you need enough memory to host your engines. Simple as that. And you need enough CPU to execute them in a timely fashion. Other than that, you can put lots of engines on a platform if you had the resources to do it. And then finally, we had one more about what is the latency and bandwidth requirement for RMC? If I try to stretch this across two different locations, is 200 megabits per second and 10 milliseconds sufficient? The, the minimum QA bandwidth that we have tested against is 128K. Um, so it should be sufficient. But again, it depends on workload and everything else, right? Uh, and should I expect to run a hundred engines across that that link that are running, you know, several hundred thousand IO points? Probably not. It's a very, these are very hard questions to answer in that there's no universal answer. It the answer is always depends, and unfortunately, that's just the case because. It just depends on physically, what are you asking these pieces of software to do? Joe says, understood. And how many platform can we reduce the sync between active and passive to reduce the bandwidth? Uh, the answer to that is, I don't believe so. I don't think that the that the redundancy scenario, the redundancy scenario can be made to be um, more tolerant. 
of network disconnects, but it's not going to reduce the bandwidth. Hey, Mike, is there like a configuration where you can actually um, specify how often it's synchronized between uh, the active and the passive? Because because I was just trying to pay attention to when it's synced to each other. It seems like there are files that are written between the two servers very often. Uh, so that's how I came about knowing that they, they do write files to each other. But um, So our parameters that we have here are in the redundancy tab. And uh, it's all about tolerating disconnects and, and network disconnecting. It's not going to change its frequency of synchronization. OK, got it. So, it does try to optimize that. It only synchronizes what changes. Hmm. And um, you know, it will attempt to uh, tolerate, you can adjust these parameters to tolerate you know, more uh, latent networks and things. But uh, it doesn't have a, it's not going to, reduce the bandwidth. I mean, if it's got, if, it, if there's not enough bandwidth to synchronize it, it'll just take longer to synchronize it, but it's not going to reduce it. But do we, do we know what the cycles are? Like, do they sync every 10 seconds? Do they sync every minute? Or how often do they have to kind of come up to sync? Uh, and currently the engines sync every scan. So if you want to slow the engine down, you can slow, slow it down, but the engine will sink every scan. Okay. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? All right. We can end early. <laughs>